Welcome back to the Emerging Civil War Virtual Symposium. Glad to have you with us. My name is Chris Mikowski, Editor-in-Chief of Emerging Civil War. Our next speaker today comes to us actually from our sister site, Emerging Revolutionary War. Mark Malloy is a historian with the National Park Service. And he's like, what can I do that's Revolutionary War? And he's like, Mark, no, 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 this is the Civil War. And he's like, well, 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 well. So um, we decided we would let him come talk about Fort Sumter because it's as close as we can get in the war to the Revolutionary War era. Um, I say all that because uh, Mark is a delightful historian, wonderful guy. I wish I could get him to laugh on cue. His most distinctive feature is his laugh, which we all really like to kind of get him pumped up and going. Um, but we're delighted to have him to come here today to speak about the first shots of the Civil War at Fort Sumter. Mark? Thank you very much uh, for that introduction, Chris. <laughs> and uh, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, speak at this uh, symposium for the emerging Civil War. Uh, you know, we'd love to have had done it in person, but um, being able to do it digitally like this is a, is a wonderful way to do it as well. So, um, but yeah, as, uh, as Chris mentioned, you know, my main passion is, is the American Revolutionary War. Um, but, uh, you know, I work for the National Park Service, and we take care of you know a lot of important Civil War sites. And I actually started my career with the National Park Service as an intern down at Fort Sumter and Fort Moultrie National Historical Park uh, in Charleston, South Carolina. And I worked there for about a year. And uh, Charleston, South Carolina, if you've never been, is a is a beautiful town. There's a lot of history, Revolutionary War history, but most people you know associate it with its important Civil War history. And uh, the war started there uh, back in 1861 in April. And so over the next 45 minutes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of go over uh, the buildup to the first shots of the Civil War there. I'm going to tell you about the battle that happened on April 12th and April 13th. And then I'm going to tell you what happened to Fort Sumter in the city following that for the rest of the war. Uh, and then what's there today and kind of what you can see. Um, and definitely encourage you if you get a chance to go down and visit at some point. Uh, hopefully after COVID, uh, and be able to check out a lot of these important historical sites uh, that are uh, pretty well preserved down there. Uh, but I really love uh, the battles uh, at Fort Sumter. Um, and uh, there's a lot of high profile characters and personalities involved in the opening shots of the, of the war. Uh, and I'm going to go through some of those as we talk uh, today. And uh, it, Fort Sumter also is really a microcosm of the Civil War and how it started off as this kind of gentlemanly, uh, chivalric uh, engagement that was you know, remarkably bloodless uh, that led to this, you know, the bloodiest war in American history. Um, and uh, it, the, the, the war really devolves, especially in Charleston, to where there's atrocities happening um, and it becomes a, a very bloody war there in Charleston Harbor towards the end. Uh, and it's also really an important uh, story to know and understand. If you're going to study the Civil War, you know, historians often are debating the, uh, the causes of secession and why the South seceded. But it's also, you know, secession didn't necessarily mean there would be a shooting war. Uh, so it's important to understand how the first shots actually came to be fired, uh, to understand why the war broke out as well. Um, and uh, Fort Sumter, at its time, was a symbol. Uh, it, it was uh, highly symbolic, uh, and it still is to this very day. Um, so it's really important to understand as well. Uh, but the story of Fort Sumter, of course, starts uh, with the secession of South Carolina, which happened on December 20th, 1860. Uh, after Abraham Lincoln was elected in November, they held their convention. Originally, it was in Columbia, then it went to Charleston. And Charleston was kind of a hotbed for secession. There were a lot of secessionists there. They were very eager uh, to leave the Union. Uh, and on December 20th, they vote unanimously 169 to 0 uh, to secede from the Union. And uh, that day was filled in Charleston in the city with all sorts of celebrations. There were fireworks, uh, bonfires, military parades, all sorts of things as they struck out on their own. And as you can see, in the, the broadside that was in the Charleston Mercury, uh, the newspaper down there, uh, proclaimed loudly that the Union is dissolved. Um, but in order to understand the military situation in Charleston Harbor, kind of have to see what the, the geography looks like. Uh, so you can see this map uh, from about that time in 1861. 
showing the city of Charleston. Now, you'll notice it's on a peninsula uh, bounded by the Ashley and Cooper Rivers. Uh, Charlestonians like to say Charleston is where the Ashley and the Cooper Rivers converge to form the Atlantic Ocean. Um, but uh, you can see Charleston Harbor is uh, surrounded all around by numerous islands. Uh, and there were four main fortifications in the harbor that historically were in that harbor to defend the city against really foreign invasion. Um, and so uh, you can see uh, just off of the, uh, the side of, of, of the city is a small little shoal with a, a little fortification called Castle Pickney. Um, let's see if I can use the pointer here. You can see Castle Pickney right here. Uh, just to the south of uh, the city of Charleston is James Island, uh, which had an old fort on there called Fort Johnson. Uh, here in the middle of the harbor uh, on an island uh, was Fort Sumter. Um, and then over here on Sullivan's Island on the north end of the, the harbor side was Fort Moultrie. Uh, so these are the four principal uh, forts. And it was Fort Moultrie where actually most of the, the, the United States soldiers who were in Charleston at that time were stationed. Uh, and so this is the uh, commander of the Union soldiers. Uh, they were in Charleston when South Carolina seceded. Uh, his name was Major Robert Anderson. Uh, and he's in command of uh, companies E and H of the 1st U.S. Artillery. Um, really only about 85 men that he's commanding that are in this, uh, in Charleston. Now it's important to realize how small the United States Army was at the outset of the war. You only have about 15,000 Union soldiers uh, across the entire nation at the time. Uh, and so, you know, they were kind of spread out all across the country. And like I said, less than 100 here in Charleston Harbor. Uh, and of those 85 men, eight were musicians in the regimental band. So uh, it was a pretty sleepy post. Uh, and most of the men, it's interesting, who were actually in the first U.S. artillery were immigrants. They came from, uh, a lot of them came from Ireland and Germany. Uh, and uh, Major Robert Anderson's an interesting figure, too, because he's actually um, uh, a southerner. He, he's from Kentucky. Uh, and he was very much against uh, the idea of secession, but he really wasn't in favor of any sort of war. Uh, he writes that his heart wasn't really in the war that he foresaw coming. Um, and he was kind of in a tricky situation here, because basically it came down to, uh, to, to property rights in Charleston Harbor. Were these federal forts, these installations, were these part of the new Republic of South Carolina, or were they part of the United States uh, uh, government? Um, and that's where a lot of the, the, the argument will come over as far as uh, who should fire the first shot. But he's a, uh, he's a, uh, his father was a Revolutionary War veteran who actually fought with George Washington at the battles of Trenton and Princeton. Um, and uh, he had many other officers under his command who would go on to play important roles during the war. Uh, he had uh, Lieutenant Norman Hall, uh, who would go on to have an important role at Gettysburg. Same thing with Samuel Crawford, who was a surgeon. Uh, he had uh, Lieutenant Jefferson Davis, not Jefferson Davis, who was the President of the, of the Confederate States, but uh, Jefferson C. Davis, uh, who would go on to fight in the Western theater of the war. Um, and Captain Truman Seymour. Uh, Seymour would go on to, to lead troops at the Battle of Lusty later in the war. So it's really interesting how many of his officers end up having important roles later in the war. Uh, this is probably one of the officers uh, uh, under his command there at Fort Moultrie uh, who would have a big role later in the war too, uh, Captain Abner Doubleday. He was captain at the time. Uh, and would go on uh, to, again, have a big role at Gettysburg. He's probably more famous, though, today. Uh, people think that he started the game of baseball, uh, which, of course, is not true, but uh, that's how he, he was remembered. And he's interesting because most of the officers uh, that were under uh, uh, Robert Anderson were not uh, abolitionists uh, and, were, and, and uh, were not really Republicans, but... Uh, uh, Abner Doubleday was, and he was very outspoken about it. And a lot of the people in Charleston didn't like that. So he was singled out in a lot of the newspapers for a lot of their vitriol. Um, but uh, he's going to be outspoken in his uh, defense of the Union and in his wanting to get rid of slavery. Well, Robert Anderson felt uh, what happened was uh, South Carolina militia started flowing into the city of Charleston. Uh, uh, Anderson didn't think that he was going to be able to hold his position at Fort Moultrie. And on December 26th, uh, he's going to make a bold move. He's going to move his entire force 
across the harbor into, into Fort Sumter. Uh, now this act in of itself, uh, some South Carolinians saw as an act of war because they viewed these installations as belonging to South Carolina. Uh, so moving troops into that fort, they, they were very much opposed to. But Anderson didn't think he could hold uh, Fort Moultrie because it was so close uh, to the mainland and that uh, he felt that you know, houses and things right around the fort, the uh, Southerners would be able to get up in there and fire into his men. So he didn't think he would be able to hold that position. So he moves over uh, to Fort Sumter. Now this is an image uh, showing them uh, raising the American flag inside Fort Sumter as a painting done later. Uh, but it's very interesting because it kind of gives you a glimpse on the inside of Fort Sumter. Now, Fort Sumter was started back in 1829, uh, and it was still under construction uh, when uh, Anderson moves his men there in December of 1860. Uh, so they were still you know, working on it 30 years after they started it. So. Uh, and as you can see inside uh, the fort, it was almost 90% though complete. Um, you can see uh, there were imposing walls uh, that stood 50 feet high. Uh, there were three tiers of uh, uh, artillery placements. Uh, the, the fort was, was pretty massive uh, for that time, and they were able, originally it was built to hold you know, over 600 men. Of course, Anderson doesn't have that many. He's not even going to be able to use all the cannons, too. It was built to hold 135 cannons, uh, and there were only about 60 in the fort at this time. Uh, but because of his manpower, he's only going to actually be able to, to man about 10 cannons uh, during the actual battle. Um, but uh, let me also show you, this is what it looked like from the outside. Uh, and Fort Sumter was a pretty imposing fortress uh, sitting in the middle of the harbor. Um, and what's going to happen is uh, once the Charlestonians wake up and they see a large American flag flying over Fort Sumter, they're outraged. Uh, and so uh, immediately, Governor Francis Pickens is going to order all of the, uh, uh, all the installations around the harbor to be seized by South Carolina troops. Um, so here you can see an image of some of the South Carolina militia taking over Castle Pickney. Uh, at this time, they didn't even have a, a symbol for their, uh, uh, for their state yet. You can see they're carrying a flag here with a star on it that they just took off the, the boat. Uh, but quickly, uh, the South Carolinas are going to adopt, uh, as their symbol, uh, the palmetto tree. Um, and that was actually Fort Moultrie, where that was built, was the site of a famous Revolutionary War battle back in 1776. Uh, and during that battle, the fort that was on that location was uh, made out of palmetto trees. Um, and the soft wood of the palmetto tree actually absorbed the shock of British cannonballs. Uh, and a British invasion force uh, was pushed back uh, in June of 1776. Um, and uh, South Carolina is going to adopt this as their symbol, uh, and you'll still see it uh, to this day on South Carolina state flag is the palmetto tree, and that harkens back to that Revolutionary War history. But this is the actual flag carried by the Palmetto Guards, which was a local Charleston militia group uh, that's going to be stationed over on Morris Island uh, during, during the uh, initial bombardment of Fort Sumter. Uh, so this is kind of gives you a good map. This is by uh, American Battlefield Trust. It kind of gives you a good view of what it looked like uh, in Charleston Harbor in 1861. Uh, you can see Sullivan's Island. Uh, they took Fort Moultrie and they started building batteries there. They even built a floating battery, uh, which is basically a raft that they put uh, cannons on and they covered it with almost like an ironclad uh, and it would float in the harbor. They could fire on the fort from there. They're gonna take uh, Fort Johnson and Castle Pinckney. And this island down here on the south, Morris Island, would play an important role, uh, not only during the first battle, but then later in the war as well. Uh, and that, that position, they're gonna fortify that island as well. Uh, and there's a battery there uh, that's manned by some students from the Citadel. Uh, there was the military college there in Charleston. Uh, and in January of 1861, uh, President Buchanan is going to send a ship uh, down to resupply and reinforce Fort Sumter. Uh, as the ship is entering, the ship was called the Star of the West, as the, the ship was entering uh, Charleston Harbor, the Citadel Cadet Battery fires on the ship, uh, and uh, they're going to fire a few rounds uh, as warning shots, and then they fire and actually hit the ship. Uh, the ship does not fire back, it's going to turn around and leave. Um, but some, and this is a, a drawing you can see of the, the Citadel cadets firing on the Star of the West. Uh, you know, some people claim these are the first shots of the Civil War, um, but that would probably be Citadel cadets and alumni of that uh, college. 
Uh, but there is no return fire. Uh, so what basically happens is it goes back into a stalemate in Charleston Harbor, uh, trying to figure out what's going to happen next. So basically what happens, uh, as the stalemate continues, uh, six more southern states are going to secede from the Union in January, February, and March of 1861. They come together in February in Montgomery, Alabama, form the Confederate States of America. Uh, they're going to you know, create their own constitution, create their own government, elect Jefferson Davis and Alexander Stevens as president and vice president, and they start forming an army. Um, the new Confederate states are going to appoint this man, uh, Pierre Gustave Totant Beauregard, uh, as uh, the general in command of the Confederate forces in Charleston Harbor. Uh, now, he's a really interesting character as well. Uh, he actually resigned from being superintendent at West Point to join the Confederacy. Uh, and when he was a student at West Point, who was his professor? None other than Major Robert Anderson. Uh, so now you have the pupil and his teacher on opposite sides of this what would turn out to be the first battlefield of the Civil War. Um, now, Sumter is going to continue to, to sit there as a symbol of the impasse that's happened in, in the country at that time. Uh, there was a, a woman, Mary Chestnut, uh, who has a wonderful uh, Civil War diary uh, that was in Charleston during this time. And Mary Chestnut writes in April of 1861, at the beginning of the month, that there stands Fort Sumter, and thereby hangs peace or war. Uh, and she also refers to the fact that one's heart is in one's mouth all the time. So there's this constant fear that eventually uh, war would break out and Charleston Harbor would be the scene of it. Uh, basically what's happening is uh, nobody's sure of what's going to happen with the situation once President Lincoln becomes president. Uh, and that happens on March 4th, 1861. Uh, Abraham Lincoln's inaugurated president of the United States. Now, how is he going to handle the situation differently than Buchanan? Uh, now, there are numerous political attempts to try and avert war. Uh, there's a peace convention in Washington, D.C. There are numerous compromises, like the Crittenden Co Compromise, to try and push off war. Uh, a peace delegation from the Confederate States is sent to Washington. Uh, but, you know, all these are rejected, and Lincoln's going to reject acknowledging the Confederate States of America, uh, believing that secession was illegal and that, that had no uh, actual authority. So all of the communications between the United States government and South Carolina and the Confederates is going to be through Governor Francis Pickens, who they uh, viewed as legitimate. Um, but Lincoln believed that the United States should hold the fort. Uh, now, something was happening on the ground there, though, because Anderson and his men were running out of food and supplies. Uh, and he wasn't going to be able to stay there forever. Uh, so he's running out of food and supplies. So what is Lincoln going to do? Uh, Lincoln is going to come up with the idea to send a relief force that would just uh, deliver food and supplies to uh, Anderson's uh, men. Uh, but if they were opposed, if they were fired on, they were going to bring reinforcements as well. Uh, well, the Confederate government views this delivering the food, but, you know, uh, uh, as an act of war because, again, uh, they didn't believe they had the right to the fort. Uh, so on April 4th, uh, the relief expedition is sent by Lincoln uh, to Charleston Harbor. Uh, on April 10th, uh, President Jefferson Davis tells Beauregard to tell Anderson to evacuate the fort immediately, and if he doesn't, to reduce the fort. Um, the next day, on April 11th, 1861, this man you see here is James Chestnut, Mary Chestnut's husband, who actually used to be senator uh, from South Carolina, who had resigned and was now a colonel uh, in the Confederate Army, who was an aide to Beauregard. He, along with uh, Captain Stephen D. Lee and Lieutenant Alexander Chisholm, uh, are going to go out to uh, Fort Sumter. They row out there. They meet with Anderson, and they tell him his options. Anderson says uh, that he's going to be uh, that he's going to be starved out uh, in just uh, four days, and that he will leave then. Um, he uh, Chestnut's going to take that message back to Beauregard. Uh, they discuss it, and then uh, around midnight, they're going to go back out one more time, uh, and they say uh, basically uh, that they they would need to leave immediately. Um, and Anderson doesn't agree to this, uh, and so Chestnut tells Anderson, well, then we will fire on you in exactly one hour, and the time was 3.30 in the morning. 
his wife is back in Charleston. She writes in her diary that at that time, I do not pre pretend to go to sleep. How can I? If Anderson does not accept terms at four, the orders are he shall be fired upon. I count four St. Michael's bells chime out, and I begin to hope. At half past four, the heavy booming of cannon. I sprang out of bed, and on my knees prostrate, I prayed as I never prayed before. Right after Chestnut meets with Anderson, uh, he's, uh, and his uh, group is going to go over to James Island to Fort Johnson. Uh, at Fort Johnson, uh, they were joined also uh, by a former Virginia congressman, uh, who you see over on the right side here, uh, named Roger Pryor. Um, and Roger Pryor was a fire eater. He was really pushing to uh, get Virginia to secede, but they hadn't at that point. Um, and what's going to happen is Chestnut's going to tell the commander of the mortar battery there, uh, who is this man you see on the left, uh, and his name was uh, Captain George S. James, who would actually die later in the war at the Battle of South Mountain. Uh, he gives him the command to fire the first shot at 4.30. Uh, James is going to give Roger Pryor the opportunity to fire the first shot, uh, and Pryor demurs. He says he cannot fire the first gun of the war. Uh, so instead, a Lieutenant Henry S. Farley uh, is given the command to fire. He's going to yank the lanyard and fire the 10-inch mortar. The cannonball arcs into the sky and explodes over Fort Sumter. That was the signal for all the batteries surrounding Charleston Harbor to open fire on Fort Sumter. Uh, and this was the first shot of the Civil War. Now, some people say that wasn't the first shot. Um, and often you hear it, uh, the first shot was this man who fired the first shot. Uh, and this guy is uh, Edmund Ruffin, uh, who is a really fascinating historical figure. Uh, he was a, very much a fire eater. He was, actually gained uh, national fame for being an agriculturalist uh, before the Civil War. He was from Virginia, uh, he was, and basically from 1855 on, he uh, devoted himself to nothing but preaching secession, uh, sometimes known as the father of secession. Uh, he travels all across the, the country uh, giving speeches. He writes pamphlets, uh, always looking to provoke uh, secession. And uh, he actually snuck in and was able to witness uh, the hanging of John Brown. Uh, and he went down to Charleston to watch the uh, secession of South Carolina. And he goes out to Morris Island. And here he is almost 70 years old. And uh, the Palmetto Guards allow him uh, into their uh, company. You can see he's wearing the uniform of the Palmetto Guards. And they're going to give him the opportunity to fire uh, the first shot after this signal went off. Uh, and he's at the Iron Battery, which is right there on Morris Island. Uh, and he yanks the lanyard. And his shot is the first one that's actually going to hit Fort Sumter. Um, and uh, he fires and hits the, the fort. Abner Doubleday, who was in the fort, actually remembers hearing that first blast hitting the fort. And he said he believed that came with compliments from Mr. Ruffin. Uh, Edmund Ruffin is uh, uh, going to keep a diary throughout the whole war, uh, which is a great resource to kind of not only see what he was thinking, but also for civilians' perspective of the whole war. Uh, but when he finds out about the defeat of General Lee's army and the collapse of the Confederacy, rather than uh, submit to what he called Yankee rule, uh, he uh, actually is going to uh, put his rifle in his mouth and shoot, shoot himself in the head uh, and commit suicide. Uh, so some argue he fired the first and the last shot of the Civil War. But once the, the battery opens up uh, on Fort Sumter, there is no response. Uh, there are 43 cannons surrounding Fort Sumter that are all firing on the fort. And uh, at first, Major Anderson's trying to conserve his powder so he doesn't fire back for a couple hours. It's not until 7 a.m. that the Union are going to fire back the first shot. And that was actually fired by Abner Doubleday. So he fires the first shot. Uh, in return. Uh, and all of a sudden now you have both sides firing back at forth at each other. And this is going to go on really for, for hours and hours. Uh, and every two minutes uh, the, the Confederates are, are firing from different batteries all around the entire island. Uh, here you can see an image of them firing on the fort. Uh, and uh, the bombardment's going to last a total of 34 hours. And meanwhile, in the city of Charleston, you can see people all ran to rooftops, and they ran up uh, to watch the bombardment. Uh, you know, similar to you'll see at First Manassas and stuff where civilians were watching this battle. Some were celebrating, some, as you see, weeping as well. Uh, and uh, you can see the batteries firing on all sides, and you'll see smoke billowing out of Fort Sumter as well. Uh, 
in addition to just you know uh, artillery shells and artillery shot, they're also firing a uh, hot shot, which is basically where they would take a uh, cannonball, put it in a furnace till it got red hot. And these were originally used to fire at ships, so they would catch them on fire and sink them. But they're using them on Fort Sumter, trying to get the buildings inside there uh, caught on fire. And they start getting successful, and they hit some of the buildings, and there are fires. Uh, Anderson's men are trying to fire back at the Confederates and put out fires within the fort. Um, and uh, and it, it starts getting pretty chaotic inside the fort. Anderson, at one point, he's only has six cannon that he's firing back at uh, everybody. Meanwhile, while this bombardment is going on on the 12th, who appears on the, on the coast but uh, the expedition that was sent to relieve Fort uh, uh, Major Anderson. Now, the Confederates were scared that this uh, group was going to try and land and try and attack them or join in on the fight, but they, they don't join in at all. Uh, much to the consternation of the defenders of Fort Sumter, because they kind of are wondering if they're going to get any relief or help uh, during this battle. Uh, but that doesn't happen. Uh, and here you see an image of, of, of the fire and the firing going on. Uh, there's a Doubleday writes memoirs after the war where he describes pretty much everything that happened. And he has a great quote that just really shows you how chaotic it was. He writes about showers of balls poured into the fort in one incessant stream causing great flakes of masonry to fall in all directions when in the immense mortar shells, after sailing high in the air, came down in a vertical direction and buried themselves in the parade ground, their explosion shook the fort like an earthquake. Uh, now, overnight of the 12th, the Union's going to stop firing again to try and conserve their ammunition, um, but they're going to resume on the morning of the 13th. Uh, now, on the 13th, uh, they're going to fire, uh, uh, they're going to fire, and they're actually going to catch the officers' quarters on fire in the fort, and that even leads to a larger fire. And there's fear that eventually this fire is going to get to the powder magazine, uh, which would blow up the entire fort. Uh, and it's around this time, around 1 p.m. in the uh, afternoon on April 13th, when a cannonball hits uh, the Union flag flying over the fort uh, and knocks it to the ground. Uh, and quickly, uh, uh, some of the Union defenders, including Sergeant Peter Hart here, you see, uh, climb up and they replace the, uh, you know, as a hail of cannonballs are flying around, replace the American flag up on top of the fort. Uh, now, during this happened, when the Confederates see the flag go down, the big cheer erupts, uh, and they think that they, they, they had just, you know, that Anderson is surrendering. Uh, and immediately, a United States senator, a former United States senator, Louis Wigfall, who's watching it happen, he quickly hops into a rowboat, rows out to the fort, uh, and you can see he immediately starts negotiating with uh, Major Anderson through the uh, embrasure, he's basically saying, uh, you know, are you surrendering the fort? Uh, Anderson uh, at first doesn't want to, but then he quickly realizes again with everything happening that he, that he should surrender. So he agrees to Wigfall that he'll surrender the fort and puts up a white flag. Um, Wigfall rows back and when Beauregard's men see the white flag go up, Chestnut goes back out there and there's some confusion because Wigfall had no authority to negotiate a surrender. Um, uh, but uh, after discussing with Chestnut, uh, you know, Anderson agrees again to surrender the fort, but they would be given uh, pretty generous terms. Uh, they'd be able to take their flag down and salute it with a cannon salute. Uh, they'd all be able to go back to New York uh, and take their personal possessions and their flags. Um, and uh, so they agree to this. Uh, on the, the next day, April 14th, is when uh, the Union prepares to leave. Uh, and while they're firing their salute, uh, it was a, supposed to be a 100-gun salute to the American flag. When they get to uh, number 47, uh, disaster happens. Uh, Private Daniel Howe is loading the cannon when all of a sudden the cannon goes off, rips off his arm. Uh, he's going to bleed out and die, but the, uh, the, the, uh, some of the powder uh, ignites powder around the cannon and an explosion happens, and about half a dozen are wounded. Uh, and one of the other men who is wounded would be mortally so. These, you could argue, are the first fatalities, military fatalities, of the Civil War. Because when Anderson surrendered the fort, you know, he had asked, you know, did the Confederates have any casualties? Uh, and they said no. Uh, and Anderson didn't have casualties during the actual battle either, which is remarkable. Uh, but Anderson also cries out, thank God, because he didn't want to be responsible for some of these first deaths. But these are this this accident that happens, uh, you know. Like I said, are the first deaths, and uh, you know. So they're going to stop it at 50 gun salute rather than do the 100 gun salute, and then uh, they 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 file out of the fort onto a ship, and they go back to the with the relief expedition back to New York. 
The Confederates march in, Edmund Ruffin at the head carrying the Palmetto flag. Uh, they're going to raise the Palmetto flag and the new Confederate States of America flag over Fort Sumter. Uh, now, what was the response to this? Uh, Lincoln is, you know, first of all, Sumter all of a sudden becomes a rallying cry. This was, you know, the, the Confederates had fired on Fort Sumter. They fired on the American flag. All across communities in the North, people are rallying to, to join up with the Union Army. Lincoln's going to immediately call on April 15th 75,000 volunteers to suppress the Southern Confederacy. Uh, you know, by doing that, again, the army at that time was only 15,000, so you can imagine how big an army that is he's talking about. Um, and these men, uh, uh, just calling up those volunteers that was going to drive just two days later to the state of Virginia to secede, uh, and later join the Confederacy, and then three other Upper South states. Um, and thus the Civil War began. Now, because of that, the you know, focus on the war quickly goes to Virginia, uh, where a lot of the fighting is going to happen, such as Manassas. Um, but, you know, the, Fort Sumter stood as the symbol of where the first shot was fired. Now, what happens to uh, Anderson and his men? They go back to New York where they're greeted as heroes. Thousands of people come to New York to see the actual flag that uh, they brought back with them that had been fired on by the Confederates. Um, and like I said, many of them are going to go off and do, uh, do much bigger things during the Civil War. And uh, some of them are going to die of disease and other things like that during the war. Probably one of the more interesting stories uh, is uh, the man you see in the back row, second from the right. Uh, his name was uh, uh, Richard Kidder Meade, uh, and he was a Virginian who had fought with Anderson's men during this battle. Uh, but when Virginia secedes on April 17th, he resigns and goes joins the Confederate Army uh, and will actually fight against the Union uh, before he dies of disease during the war. Uh, but Charleston, you know, the Union's going to come back in 1861 later that year to South Carolina. And uh, the Confederates are very quick to fortify uh, the entire harbor. So you can see the massive amount of earthworks they're going to build all around the harbor. Uh, and like I said, Morris Island's going to be important. The Union's going to eventually uh, make that as one of their, their headquarters. Eventually they'll get onto Morris Island to get a foothold. Uh, they're going to try taking Charleston uh, by, uh, by land. And they're going to meet utter disaster at the Battle of Secessionville in June of 1862, which uh, Dan Welch gave a wonderful presentation of at last year's Emerging Civil War Conference. Uh, after that disaster, they're going to keep trying to capture Fort Sumter by sea. Uh, they're going to do a large ironclad attack on the fort in April of 1863 that's bloodily repulsed. Uh, and then, so then the Union, like I said, once they get on Morris Island down here, they're going to try multiple attempts to try and, and capture the whole island. If you've seen the famous movie Glory, this is where the Battle of Fort Wagner happens in July of 1863. Uh, that's repulsed, though, as well. And, uh, but eventually, the Confederates, because of manpower and other reasons, they're going to abandon Morris Island. And once the Union captures Morris Island, uh, they're less than half a mile from Fort Sumter. Uh, and artillery had, you know, grown leaps and bounds by this point. Uh, you know, the artillery they were using during that first battle was only, it was smooth bore, it was only accurate really up to a mile. By this point, they have rifled artillery, it's accurate up to four or five miles. Uh, in fact, the Union have a large cannon, the, the Swamp Angel, uh, that was firing rounds into the city of Charleston, um, which was, like I said, a distance about four miles. Uh, but once they, get, once they get onto Morris Island, the Union's just going to hammer Fort Sumter. They're going to fire on it uh, uh, almost continuously uh, all throughout 1864 and 1865. Uh, and uh, it's just going to be an unrelenting attack uh, to try and capture Fort Sumter. They're gonna, the new rifled artillery just demolishes the walls. You can see this is what it looked like by that point. Uh, the rifle artillery just smashes through these brick walls, uh, but what they didn't realize is actually making it stronger because all, the, all this mess fell down and basically turned Fort Sumter into one giant earthwork. Uh, and the Confederates are going to be like living like rats on the inside of it uh, and fighting back uh, and all sorts of attempts by the Union to land, put landing groups on there to try and capture it. Uh, and those are going to be repulsed as well, so they just kind of uh, uh, resort to that. Now, like I said, uh, the, the war kind of starts devolving, and you know, South Carolina refuses because of the symbolic importance of Fort Sumter really refuses to give up on Fort Sumter. Uh, this is an image uh, by Conrad Wise Chapman, uh, who painted all sorts of scenes from that time around Charleston Harbor, uh, and you can see this lone Confederate sentry 
uh, standing there with the second national Confederate flag. Uh, in the distance, uh, you can see uh, the Union blockade, all of their vessels arrayed out there, and you can also see Morris Island where they were, were, were shelling Fort Sumter from. Uh, but like I said, not only were they shelling Fort Sumter, they're also hitting the city of Charleston. Uh, so what Confederate forces do, they're actually going to put some Union prisoners of war in Charleston in the city and let the Union know that you know, they might hit some of their own men. Uh, in retaliation to this, uh, the Union's going to take Confederate prisoners uh, down, and they're going to put them on the, on the edge of Morris Island there to kind of use them as human shields. Uh, so here again, like I said, this, how this war had devolved from this kind of gentleman's warfare to by the end they're, they're literally using humans as, uh, uh, as hum or using prisoners as human shields. Um, but over the course of, uh, and this is a sh another shot after the war of what Fort Sumter looked like, over the course of two years, uh, the Union is going to fire 3,500 tons of metal into that island. Uh, and, uh, it, and like I said, just turn it into one giant earthwork. Uh, but they never do capture it. Uh, they're never able to actually capture Fort Sumter. Uh, and the uh, Confederates are going to hold Charleston all the way up until February of 1865. By that point, uh, Sherman had completed his march to the sea down in Savannah. He was marching up through South Carolina, uh, and people were wondering if he was going to go to Charleston or Columbia. He goes to Columbia instead of Charleston, but it basically made indefensible uh, the city of Charleston. So the Confederates on February 17, 1865, evacuate Charleston Harbor, and they evacuate Fort Sumter. Uh, the next day, February 18th, Union soldiers finally get back uh, Fort Sumter, and they raise the American flag over it. Uh, General Sherman, you know, Charleston had been ravaged by being shelled during the war. They also uh, suffered a fire in 1861 that burned out a lot of the city as well. Uh, General Sherman and many of the uh, Union soldiers wanted revenge on Charleston for having started the war. Uh, he wrote that, I doubt any city was ever more terribly punished in Charleston, but as her people had for years been agitating for war and discord and had finally inaugurated the Civil War, the judgment of the world will be that Charleston deserved the fate that befell her. Uh, on April 14, 1865, Major Anderson, who's now general, he returns to Fort Sumter to ceremoniously re-raise the same American flag up over Fort Sumter. Um, and the celebration that happened that day, of course, was overshadowed that same night uh, was when President Abraham Lincoln was shot in uh, Washington, D.C. at Ford's Theater. So what's Fort Sumter today? So today, if you go visit the fort, uh, which is, you know, today, it was used by the U.S. military all the way to the 1940s, and now it's a National Park Service site. Uh, you will see uh, the immediate thing you notice is there is no more of those three tiers of, uh, uh, of walls. There's only one level of uh, the brick wall around the island. And you'll see this large black uh, uh, battery that was built during the Spanish-American War that now uh, uh, sits in the middle of the parade ground. So there have been numerous changes over there and very little fabric from the original 1861 still exists, but it does exist on different places uh, in the island. And uh, inside this battery today is a wonderful museum that has a lot of objects related to the actual battle. Uh, this is what it looks like on the parade ground uh, inside today. Some of the casemates are still uh, surviving, so you can check those out. And uh, you can see the ruins over here of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the different barracks and officers' quarters. Uh, they were in there. That's near where the powder magazine was as well, as well as a monument to the defenders uh, of the fort. Uh, you can still see uh, some of the actual you know, uh, artillery uh, that was fired during that siege from 1863 to 1865 by the Union from Morris Island, still embedded in some of the brick walls, which is amazing that you can still see that piece of history on the fort's walls today. Uh, inside uh, the museum there, you will see the actual flag. This is a storm flag that Anderson's men flew during the battle, uh, uh, which is a pretty amazing artifact. They also had a larger garrison flag uh, that's uh, at Liberty Square, which is an, another site run by the National Park Service down there. Uh, but Fort Sumter, if you do get a chance to go down there, it's not, of course, it's not the only site uh, to see. This is what Fort Moultrie looks like. Uh, and again, this is where some of the first shots were fired by the Confederates. And like I said, it was the site of that Revolutionary War battle. So you can definitely check out that. And they interpret really all of you know, American coastal defense from 1776 on up to World War II. 
Uh, probably one of the neatest sites if you get down there is to go to Fort Johnson, where that first initial shell was fired uh, by Captain George S. James. There's a marker out there today uh, denoting that as the location of the first shot of the Civil War. Morris Island is really cool. That's where you know, Fort Wagner was and where Edmund Ruffin was. But uh, that has changed a lot uh, due to the tides. Um, and uh, so and there's nothing out there. All the earthworks have been washed away. And there's no monuments or markers or anything else like that. Uh, and it's only accessible by boat. So it's kind of difficult to get out there. Um, but yeah, so you have multiple sites to check out in there. But Charleston overall is a, is a beautiful city. Uh, and a lot of people associate it with this initial story of what happened there uh, during the Civil War. But the history goes all the way back, uh, like I said, to even before the Revolutionary War. Uh, and uh, you know, a lot of the original buildings and sites still exist. So it's a, it's a wonderful place to visit and to really you know, involve yourself in a lot of history there. Um, but yeah, so thank you very much. Oh, if you want to uh, read more about these, if you want to read about the initial battle, I definitely recommend uh, Allegiance uh, by David Detzer. It's a very good overview of that first battle. Uh, if you want to know about the siege of Charleston that happened from 63 to 65, read Gate of Hell by Stephen Wise. Uh, and hopefully, I think by next year, uh, the former historian for uh, the National Park Service down there, Rick Hatcher, who had the uh, privilege of working with when I worked at Fort Sumter, is going to have an emerging Civil War series book called Thunder in the Harbor uh, that should uh, cover all of this uh, and hopefully also include a lot of uh, these sites you can visit. So, But thank you all very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak here today.